Hello. Just to say, for people sitting over there, there's a load of space still over on this side. Um, if you if you if you want to sit in in seats over there, there's uh, still a bunch of free ones if you want to migrate across, um, which might be good as more people come in. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of takers. Okay. Um, so I think we're gonna we're gonna kick off. Um, we do try to build in and the knowledge that uh, if we say 10 o'clock, we'll start at 10:30. But um, so, but 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 we we I think we'll begin now. If if people people have seen the program, I'm gonna give a kind of welcome and introduction, and then we're gonna we hand over to our first keynote, Glenn Moody. Okay, there are more people. Just one more. Come, yeah, I'm go. Come over this end. There's a load of seats over on this side. Yeah. Encourage people to do that. Okay, so welcome, welcome to the Open Knowledge Room, to OKCon. It's the 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 annual conference the OKF, the Open Knowledge Foundation, put on as the both both for us and for the wider open knowledge community. And I just wanted to, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of time today for about about 15, 20 minutes, both to introduce the event, but also to introduce the OKF a little bit. Um, because while some of you will be very familiar with what we do, um, I'm sure there's some of you who may, who may never have heard of us before. So just to say, we're, we're a community-based, we're not for profit, and we started in 2004. Uh, we start off, I was one of the co-founders, and we started in the UK, but we now have members, projects, and partnerships uh, around the world. In particular, this event, um, which has basically been organized by the Open Knowledge Foundation Deutschland, the chapter here is really active. And what we do is we build tools and communities uh, around an open knowledge commons, around material that anybody is free to use, reuse, and redistribute. And that we believe that by doing that, by creating the commons and by building the tools and communities to make use of that material, uh, we can make a significant contribution to improving governance, research, and the economy. And obviously not just us, but other people who work in this area. And I just want to give a kind of concrete example of why I think open material and open data is important. And I, I think in some way it comes out of convergence in this world of two things, which is uh, information and almost the information overload. We have so much of it. We have so much data and material. And the other is the technology. So on this laptop, I am now able to have almost all of the UK government spending, not only for the last year possibly, but for the last decade which is something that probably wasn't even possible a decade ago, 15 years ago. I, as a personal individual, would not have had access to that kind of processing capability. And to, to give a, an example, I'm just going to uh, tell a brief story, which is about a heart disease and uh, coronary operations. So um, as you know, uh, you know, people nowadays, aging population, particularly in the West, people eat maybe more stuff than is good for them. There are lots of heart attacks, triple heart bypass, etc. And in the US, um, in Northern California, in Shasta County, there was something called the Reading Medical Center, which was uh, a hospital. It was a run for, by a for-profit health care chain, which may turn out to be important to this story. But basically, um, you know, in, in uh, 2001, uh, a Catholic priest called John Carapi, um, he's a slightly unusual Catholic priest in that he had... Uh, you know, he had once worked in Vegas uh, in the casinos, but he'd, he'd seen the light and he was a Catholic priest and he, he had chest pains and he went into, he, he went to see his doctor, his primary care doctor, and his doctor uh, recommended him to uh, the, the main cardiologist at the local center. And he went in there, he had an angiogram, which is, uh, you know, a, tr um, a procedure where they kind of look, they kind of insert something through a small kind of keyhole into you into, and look at your heart. And the guy said, came back and said, my God, you know, you're going to die, basically die tomorrow. You've got to have an operation immediately, have, have a bypass. And you know, he was pretty stunned, as you can imagine. It's quite, I mean, it's, it's quite a significant operation as it is, and you're being told that you know, you're, you're on the brink of, brink of possible death. Um, but, but he did say he wanted to go home. The guy said, you should go straight into surgery. But he said, I want to go home. He went home, and he called his friend, who was still working in Vegas as an accountant, and his friend, who was quite a tough-minded guy, and who had, a, and more, more importantly, had a partner who was a nurse, said, you should have a second opinion. Um, you know, you can, you can, you'll live for two days. Come and have a second opinion. And so he actually flew down to Vegas, and uh, his, his, his colleague's uh, partner arranged to see a doctor. And the doctor did a, bu did a bunch of tests, looked at his stuff, and just said, I don't know what's going on. You're completely healthy. 
there's nothing wrong with you and your heart. I mean, there may be other issues, but your heart is absolutely fine. At which point, you know, he was like, wow, what a relief. I don't know what happened, but I'm just going home. But his friend, who was kind of one of these guys who's maybe like, you know, we've got to be tough about this, you know, and saying, what, you know, what went on? How did you get this diagnosis? Please come on across, by the way. There's lots of space. Um, and he was like, well, look, I'm just so relieved. I don't really want to deal with this. But his friend insisted. And they went in and saw the CEO of the Reading Medical Center. Um, and the CEO wasn't very helpful. Um, was kind of like, they said, well, look, you know, what happened here? Are you going to investigate this? Are you going to check your procedures by which people get diagnosed? It's quite serious. I, was going to, I would have had a you know, heart operation, which is a very significant procedure, unnecessarily. And they were like, yeah, no, we understand. But you know, basically, we're not going to do anything. And um, at this point, you know, the Karapi just wanted to, really wanted to drop it and go home. And his friend insisted, and eventually, one way or the other, they ended up notifying the local FBI office um, on the basis they thought this could be fraudulent. You can't, obviously, the FBI are not interested in just cases of simple medical negligence. It's a question of fraud. And um, started, you know, the FBI office was pretty dubious. They started digging around. They eventually discovered uh, various people. They discovered that, you know, there was a kind of general sense that a lot of heart operations went on. This center had an incredible reputation, by the way. It had one of the best mortality rates for heart treatment in the U.S., for these kind of hospitals, um, it was, it was, it was, um, you know, it was in the community. It was highly respected. It was one of the biggest employers in the town. Um, it was the, one of the most profitable uh, hospitals for uh, tenant healthcare who ran it. Um, but the guy started digging, and there was this kind of there were the kind of urban myths. You know, people said, you know, if you got a flat tire in front of the Reading Medical Center, you'd, you'd come out with a triple heart bypass. Um, <laughs> you know, there was this kind of reputation that it was a lot of heart health care. And you know, eventually they they did start an investigation. They got details from some primary care doctors who had concerns. And they discovered that over a period of about a decade, maybe longer, they don't know, but from about 1992 to 2002, approximately somewhere between you know, 1,000 and 1,500 people were unnecessarily uh, operated on. Um, uh, you know, they had no heart problems and they had been, they had been treated and, and often had very serious operations. Some of them had died from complications arising from their operations. Um, some of them, uh, you know, were in permanent pain. Some, you know, one guy, a terrible story, had kind of his, his chest had never knit back together. When you cut someone open, you, you cut through their, their chest and, you know, it never re-knit and he was in permanent pain basically for the rest of his life. Um, and, you know, this is pretty extraordinary in that, you know, the cardiologists have been misdiagnosing and then they've been operating on the basis of that. And obviously this explains, you know, if you operate on healthy, healthy people, you tend to have a very good mortality rate. Um, that was one of the reasons it had such a good reputation. But what was interesting was that if you had looked at the data, if you retrospectively looked at the data, that hospital was doing an extraordinary number of cardiological operations and treatments for the size of the population in its treatment area. So there was, a, there was, in some way, a big red flag, at least, on something where you might have wanted to look at, and which put together with the kind of rumors that if you'd investigate in the community, and the interesting thing was once you started talking to doctors, primary care doctors, they were aware that there were issues. Um, you know, th there were, some of them were aware, they were dubious about what was going on, but nothing had happened for a decade. No one had noticed, really. No one had done anything. And so I guess the point I'm saying about that is that kind of information, there are hundreds of those kind of small slivers of information, red flags of that kind. Hey, you know, this, this hospital is treating 10 times as many people as we would expect for, for, for you know, heart operations. Um, this, 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 um, you know, this department or this project within this department has gone over budget by 15 times or whatever it is. There are all kinds of these slivers of information, but we're almost overwhelmed with them. And it's easy in retrospect to look back and say, hey, this hospital had an issue. It's very difficult to pick out that thing and to pick it out if you're just a, you know, a few number of health researchers and universities who look at these kind of stats. But in a world in which millions of people possibly could look at that data and would have the tools to look at that data and maybe then go further, not just say, hey, this is a red flag, but 99 times out of 100, that's going to be fine. There is a reason why that's happening. It's not a problem. So I guess that's one of the things, one of the things that, that, that motivated me and motivates us is this belief that combining this kind of information, you know, if you like, tsunami, um, but with the, the, the breadth of, of investigation, the breadth of, of interest and the breadth of community to actually take advantage of it. And not just to kind of find um, necessarily bad things, but also good things. Uh, you know, there may be great, you know, great examples. You might say, my God, this hospital is doing amazingly well. What are they doing that's so good? Or, you know, this department is being incredibly efficient or doing a great job of delivering on its services. Um, 
but identifying that in this world of, of information overload, but combined with the technology where many of us can have access to, to that data, I believe requires open data and requires the sharing. That's the kind of thing that underpins it. Without that commons of material, we can't um, really take advantage of, of that material uh, and of the access to the information. Now, I'm just going to go through a little quickly, just to say a little bit about the OKF for people who don't, don't know. And it might even be interesting, you know, the OKF is, is a bit of a, it's all kind of, it's community based and organically grown, so sometimes it kind of sprawls around. Um, even I, you know, started it, sometimes discover things it's doing that I didn't know about. Um, um, so, you know, just to give people an idea, this is kind of broad communities where we're based. And then we kind of try and centre that about certain things, like working groups, which will look at particular sectors. They might look at science. They might look at government data. Particular projects in particular areas. Developers, there's the community coordinators. And there's local chapters, which are kind of regional focus. Um, and this isn't everybody, but just some examples. There's me, there's Jonathan Gray, who's sitting here at the front, um, who, who was the kind of first guy who, who, ever, who, who, who we ever kind of hired. Um, Jason, who's, our, who's kind of our project coordinator, there's a whole bunch of working group leads. I won't name them all. Jenny Malloy is here. He's helped um, run Open Science Working Group. James Gardner, who leads CCAN. And there's local chapters. So people come and say, hey, I want to start a regional interest group somewhere. Or, or, you know, and if, that, if that's successful, it can become an official chapter um, with various things. But just, just to give you an idea of this kind of the organizational diagram of, of the OKF. And, and people can get involved almost at every level. Um, you know, we... we People can come along and just say, hey, I want to I start a working group or join a working group. I want to start a local uh, regional interest group or even I want to join the board. You know, we're interested in people who want to join the board at the moment, uh, which is kind of almost some of our most dedicated volunteer time comes from board members who all give their time to, to oversee stuff and have done an amazing job. And to give an example of a project, some people may know about this project, uh, openspending.org, its aim is to map the money globally, track every public financial transaction from governments and corporations. And it started with Where Does My Money Go? Uh, two or three years ago, um, which we got some support from the Cabinet Office in the UK. It started off in the UK, but expanding, and we've collaborated with often a household here in Germany, and now over 15 plus countries around the world. And you know, again, it's community-based. We're looking for people in every country, every city in the world to say, hey, just like you map your street in OpenStreetMap, I want to map the spending in, in, in my district. Um, and there's a, a bunch of material uh, there. Then the CCAN, um, the Comprehensive Knowledge Archive Network, which is, is, is software, our data hub software, which makes it easy to get, use, and share data. Um, it's free and open source. We started in 2006, 2007, and it's been evolving all that time. And it's, it's central to this vision of how we can do distributed, collaborative, componentized development of data, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. And it helps power a whole bunch of other sites. It helps power data.gov.uk, um, often a Darton, it's a community uh, catalog here in Germany, publicdata.eu, which kind of just relaunched last uh, couple of weeks ago. And so it powers a whole bunch of stuff. And just today, I'm pleased to announce that it's, it's um, going to power uh, datacatalogs.org, which is, there are now actually so many of these data catalogs that, that we want to kind of keep some track of them. Um, and that um, in partnership with DataGov UK, data.gov, the World Bank, uh, the Sunlight Foundation and a bunch of other uh, organizations, we're kind of getting together at datacatalogs.org to list what's, what's out there so that we can bring together some of this data. It's almost getting difficult to track and also sometimes difficult to track. Uh, also in a good way, we want to encourage people, sometimes there's a lot of stuff that's kind of open data but isn't yet kind of fully open and we want to be able to kind of say, hey, you know, you're releasing data, make sure it's fully open and so on. And a bunch of other projects, some of which a lot of them have done. Utopia.net, for example, which was a winner of the World Bank's apps competition. Guazu, who's in the audience, and Dirk Hine just came up with this idea and came to the OKF and said, hey, we want to help build this. And we did a two-day sprint early this year in, in which we, we built that and submitted that. So it's a kind of example of someone just coming along and, and doing something with us. There are these working groups. There are now more than a dozen. Um, they bring together these experts from a, a, across a whole bunch of areas, but also community. Um, they bring, it's a way for us to, to focus in a particular area. You know, you're interested in science and you're interested in open government data. And one of our big lessons um, of working in this area since we started is that not all, you know, there's commonality and you know, it's one of the things that underpins what we do, the OKF. There's still space this side if you want to come and sit down. There's, there's stuff to sit. Um, but the, there's a really powerful thing that I think there's a lot of commonality about open data. At the same time, you need to be specific. 
you go and talk to a chemist, they're not necessarily interested in the same thing as someone who's interested in Shakespeare, right? You know? um, and it's really important to focus down. So that's the working groups. Um, and then we have the chapters and regional groups which is a way of focusing geographically. So if you're in a city or you're in a country and you want to say, hey, I want to do stuff around open data or around open knowledge, um, and I, you know, you want, if, you know, we can help you set up a, a kind of a local regional group. Um, you can also join the community simply by going to okfn.org slash register and becoming a community member, um, which, which you know, allows you to be put in touch with other, other people. And we just started having official chapters. So one in Germany started last year, the Open Knowledge Foundation Deutschland, and one just started in Austria uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was officially, officially became a chapter, having already been doing stuff for quite a while. So I just want to finish up by looking forward a bit. That's what the, the foundation is. But where do we generally, I mean, I don't know, the community is diverse, but where do we want to go as a wider community, particularly around open data? And how do we, I guess the question that I ask is, how do we build an open data ecosystem? So... <coughs> Almost two or three years ago when I would be giving, when, we'd have, when we ran OKCon and, and people would come, the issue there was almost, hey, there's no data. There's no actual open data. Well, there's very, very little. And when we started CCAN.net, which was the, the registry uh, in 2007, there was material that was clearly intended to be open and maybe there was public domain material from the US government. But there was almost no explicitly licensed open data from anyone else. Um, it, it, and so a lot of the time then, we just used to sit there and go, my God, you know, we need material. We don't have any material to work with that's open. Um, but I think in the ecosystem, there are three things we need. We need material, we need open material, we need tools, open tools, and we need people, we need communities. Open data is an end in itself. If we don't build things with the data, it's not going to be useful. And I think right now, we're gradually solving what I call the quantity problem. Um, I think it's a huge way to go in the sense that there's lots and lots of data sets, the most obvious being transport. I mean, you know, transport data across the world isn't really available. There's huge amounts of other material that isn't still open license. But my feeling now, particularly with government, is that there's enough governments kind of leading the way, and my pressure with governments, a lot of me tooism that it's kind of unstoppable now. You know, I may be proved terribly wrong, but the momentum on this is, is it, it's just going to keep going. And it's a question now of not getting left behind if you're government. Or, you know, if you're some other, you know, organization, it's a question, you know, are you not, you know, not if, but when, maybe. But there's still plenty to do. But the issue then is about tools and people. So right now, most people, most people who work with data, data wranglers, we were doing this yesterday. You want to do stuff with open data or, you know, you're dealing with just kind of average people, you boot up Google Docs or you boot up Excel. The tools that you tend to use, and those are great tools. I'm not knocking them, they're amazing tools, but they are both proprietary. Um, they're built on a stack that I don't have access to and that I can't improve and that I can't adapt to different purposes. Um, you know, if we're doing data refining, and I, the amazing Scraper Wiki project, which I know has had run a workshop here, you know, it's, we, we do, we're, we're aiming to do a lot of this stuff in, as well in CCAN. If you're doing data refining, um, how, you know, we want to do this in a distributed community, in a community that isn't one big company or even one big open knowledge foundation, but it's lots of people doing stuff. How are we going to do that? Distributed, collaborative, componentized data uh, development, data refining. Most of our tools to do this are, are currently closed. And how do we weave that data together? We, you know, we're only beginning to work out how we do this. You know, people obviously know the semantic web, linked data, but I think we'd all agree that the, that the mechanisms at the moment for getting dis different data sets and putting them together in any automated way or, or combining them uh, in, in any fashion is, is only beginning to be worked out. How do you share patches for data? How do you say, oh, I fixed this data, but I don't have right access to the UK government budget for good reason? Right, you know, um, uh, but I might spot, you know, we now have like two million transactions from the UK government in openspending.org. I may well spell that some of them, there's a mistake, right? How do I, how do I let them know that in, in an efficient way without them giving me full right access, you know? Um, we don't have that kind of stuff really for data at all. So how do we, and you know, fundamentally for me, this is how do we go from the data line to data cycles? At the moment when people do stuff with data and they build a lot of cool apps, and they do a lot of cool stuff, I think it really looks like this straight line where they, they get stuff, they clean it up, they build their front-end app, and if you're lucky, they release the data they've cleaned up in doing that or whatever. And there's no cycle. There's no way where that data goes back to its source where you let whoever gave you the data that's wrong or you, or you, or you repackage the data for other people to use. Um, how do we build a real ecosystem um, and go from a data line to data cycles? So enjoy the conference. Thank you very much.